Good morning and welcome to this WIO webinar. My name is Sarah Goldhammer. I'm here with Miley Signoroti from the Southern Illinois Professional Development Center. We'll be your facilitators for today's webinar. Today's topic is the Integrated Resource Team and WIOA, the strategy and relevance. We'd like to thank our presenters, Brian Ingram and Sarah Loazzo. They're gonna tell you a little bit more about themselves in just a minute, but we thank them very much for joining us today. So a couple of housekeeping tips before we get started. As a reminder, all participants are in mute mode. Please use the raise your hand function in the webinar if you would like to speak to the presenters or question box if you have any comments and questions. And I believe our presenters have um, an hour presentation, about an hour, and then they're gonna have time for Q&A at the end. So this webinar will be recorded and be available on the Illinois WorkNet website, usually in the next 48 hours. You'll receive a survey asking you about today's webinar. So please share with us your experience and any suggestions you might have to help us improve these webinars. So without further delay, let me turn it over to our guest presenters today. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Brian Ingram and I work for the National Disability Institute on the WinTech project, which is the Workforce Innovation Technical Assistance Center. Um, and what we do there is, is we're funded through RSA to provide technical assistance to vocational rehabilitation agencies around implementing WIOA. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you, Sarah, for inviting us. And thank you, everybody, for showing up. Uh, a little bit about my background. Um, I'm old, so very old now. And I've been kicking around mostly uh, Portland, Oregon is where I started. Um, I started in the disability field many, many years ago, working in a sheltered workshop, believe it or not. And uh, from there, I progressed to being a VR vendor to working in the Title I system as a, kind of a special populations expert, doing a lot of projects with the WIB in Portland. From there, I went to being the uh, DPN navigator under the DPN initiative in the Title I system. And then um, when the DEI, the Disability Employment Initiative happened, I got uh, snapped up by the NDI, National Disability Institute, to provide technical assistance uh, for Title I systems in the state. So that's sort of my background. And I have to say this topic, the integrated resource team, is something that's kind of been a constant in my career, uh, pretty much since the Disability uh, Navigator Initiative. We'll talk more about that later, but again, I'm happy to be here. I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Loazzo, so she can introduce herself. Sarah, you ready? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Yeah, my name is Sarah Loazzo, and I also work with WinTAC at National Disability Institute. I've been with National Disability Institute for about a little over two years now. I primarily work on something called the Disability and Employment Initiative. I do the technical assistance for all 12 of those projects across the state. They're run by Department of Labor's um, Employment and Training Administration and Office of Disability and Employment Policy. I also help work with the WinTech team as well, and mainly talking about integrated resource teams, which is what we're gonna talk about today. I have a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling, and I'm a certified rehabilitation counselor. I have worked with um, the Commission for the Blind in Massachusetts. I also worked as a disability resource coordinator on the DEI round five project in Massachusetts. I am originally from Illinois, so I'm really excited to be on the call today with several Midwesterners, because that's where my heart is definitely near and dear. But I have been working in this field now for about 13, 14 years. And I'm looking forward to today. Thank you. Brian, ready to get started? Yep, why don't we dive right in, Sarah? So if you could advance the slide, I think um, we will get started. So the integrated resource team, what is it and why should you care, right? Let me start by saying that this strategy is anything but new, as I mentioned earlier. So maybe a quick outline of its history might be the best way to start explaining it to you. If you could advance a slide. So the IRT strategy 
was developed in the Title I system during the course of two pretty extensive disability-focused initiatives funded through the Department of Labor. Labor. The Navigator Initiative of 2001 through 2009 and the Disability Employment Initiative that Sarah mentioned uh, that started in 2010 is, and has been running till now. So the strategy was developed to address the resource challenges that initiative staff were encountering in the job centers. This again is not gonna surprise anyone listening, but as the initiative staff began to focus on serving customers with disabilities in the job centers, they quickly realized that the clients were presenting with multiple resource needs, multiple challenges to employment, and that the resources that the job center staff were able to apply directly to these job seekers was not nearly adequate to position them to reach program outcomes. For example, a client who is currently homeless was gonna have a hard time benefiting from a vocational training, right? No matter how appropriate that training might be to subsequent employment. They also realized that these same clients were needing supports that fell well outside their areas of expertise and well outside of their comfort zones. So these staff came to another conclusion as well based on what they were seeing on the ground, that many of the resources and the expertise needed to address the challenges they were seeing were theoretically available in other systems that a job seeker could potentially be eligible for, but that the current way they were making referrals wasn't entirely successful. In fact, in many cases, it led to a whole new set of problems centered around how to coordinate multiple service plans without confusion of the job seeker or the staff or the duplication of services. Finally, the initiative staff, because of their disability focus, found themselves working with job seekers who were already receiving or desperately needed vocational rehabilitation services. This led many places to vocational rehabilitation, working with initiative staff to address these issues and contributing to this strategy's development from the very beginning. Okay, if you could advance the slide. Now, we have these disability focused initiative staff working toward full access for job seekers with disabilities to vocational services and the outcomes associated with these services in the job centers. And they're running into the sad reality that these job seekers needed more resources and different expertise than they could give them directly. They also figured out that in many cases, the needed resources and expertise were sitting in other systems, but a simple referral to those systems wasn't ensuring access. In fact, it often seemed to create more problems and confusion because the systems involved did not have procedures in place to partner effectively and individual counselors and initiative staff did not have the time or the authority to create them. It seemed like what was needed was a customer level, informal approach to these issues. An approach that was focused on a single customer because although the staff working with the customer often lacked the authority to initiate systems change, the individual being served had the authority to convene the partners working with them and could give them permission to coordinate the services that they were providing directly to her. Once initiative, set, once initiative staff set out to do this on purpose, it became clear that what they were developing at the customer level could have systems level significance as well. But I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. I need to get off my soapbox and move on to the next slide. So if we could advance the slide. I'm gonna give this over to my colleague, Sarah, to talk about WIOA and the IRT. Sarah, you ready? Sarah? I was muted. I apologize. <laughs> no worries. I'm ready to get started. The IRT was a huge success during the Navigator and DEI initiatives from the very beginning. But I have to say, the strategy really caught fire and gained momentum. The IRT aligns with WIOA's goals and intentions like a hand in a glove, 
just check this out. Next slide, please. The usefulness from some guidance issued jointly by the Departments of Labor and Education that cites the strategy directly. Program coordination standards might also include operational standards such as integrated resource teams, such as those piloted in the Disability Employment Initiative or other methods are used to jointly fund services to meet the specific needs of individuals. Resource rooms include high quality, up-to-date information about the services and supportive services available to individuals. Next slide, please. Both operational success and subsequent attention given to the IRT might be tied to the many ways the IRT strategy operationalizes the requirements laid out for the six core services covered by the legislation. Let's take a look. WIOA calls for the streamlining of core programs, including the development of a combined uni or unified state plan and also focusing services on targeted populations that have barriers to employment and for providing more wraparound services. The IRT streamlines services through a cross-agency team approach and offer a tangible model for providing wraparound services based on the individual need of the job seeker to help the job seeker meet their employment goal. We owe a common performance. Next slide, please. The IRT aligns with the OA in some a bit more detail later in the presentation. But for now, just remember that it's consumer focused, outcome driven, informal, and applicable through multiple outcomes. Delivery environment created by WIOA. I would like you to keep the points we just outlined in mind as we discuss what an IRT is and how to implement one. All right, let's dive in and define the IRT. Next slide, please. And Sarah, if I could just mention before we go on the next slide, you're cutting in and out. I don't know if there's anything you can do to adjust your microphone. But if you could yeah, give let that me a try. try. Okay, no. thank okay. you. No problem. Well, Brian will be up next for the next slide. Yes, I will. Okay. IRT. Let me start this section by saying that there is nothing new about IRTs. I spent the last 15 years doing and training people to do them all over the country. And everywhere I go, I find counselors and case managers who are already doing some or most of what we're going to be discussing today. The strategy is based on tried and true concepts of vocational case management and self-determination. And anyone familiar with these concepts is not gonna be lost in our discussion. As I often like to say, it ain't rocket science. What makes an IRT strategy a strategy is also very simple. You intend to do it. You do it purposefully and you do it in a way that's transparent to both the client and the partners you're working with. So what exactly is an IRT? Let's find out. Next slide, please. Okay, the IRT is about a single individual getting an actual job. If it isn't about getting a job, it's not an IRT. There are many, many other reasons to convene your partners, both at the systems and the customer level, to work out a referral flow, to discuss how to more effectively work together, even to discuss files about customers you have in common. But these aren't IRTs. An IRT is convened solely and specifically by a client to help that client obtain employment. It does this by supporting the client to convene the providers they're working with and have a discussion, a negotiation really, to reach a consensus around three key parameters. These are, and this will not be the only time you hear this during our, our presentation today, <laughs> a common employment goal, lines of communication, and a sequence of services. 
That's it. That's what makes a group of providers and a shared customer an IRT. In the end, it doesn't really matter how consensus is attained or how many or which partners are at the table or what services are being delivered. These details vary. They're intended to vary based on what each individual needs to reach their employment goal. It's about that individual. It's the client that gives you the authority to convene and who makes the ultimate determination of what services will be appropriate to help them to achieve their goal. Next slide, please. Here's another more thoughtful way to put it. The integrated resource team is an informal agreement between a consumer and the systems providing services to that consumer, allowing the members to coordinate services at the individual customer level around a shared employment goal. So if the customer gives their consent for the providers to coordinate and the providers engage in an information exchange, then reach consensus around the three key parameters, a great deal of confusion and wasted time can be avoided. All parties participating in the team, including the customer, are gonna be held to a higher level of accountability by the transparent nature of the process and the opportunity provided by the discussion to clarify unclear information or expectations. And finally, the client's gonna be able to benefit from a richly resourced placement strategy that addresses multiple challenges to employment simultaneously and accesses all needed area of expertise that gives them the best chance for success. Notice I didn't say a placement plan, that's on purpose because each provider is still gonna have their own service plan. The team doesn't replace the partner's plan with a super plan. It just aligns the existing of plans around those three key parameters. All the partners can claim the outcome once it's attained in their own plans and get full credit in their own systems. That's pretty cool, right? <laughs> I always thought it was. Okay, let's move to the next slide. So up until now, we've been discussing the IRT strategy at the consumer level, and it's indeed a consumer level strategy by definition. However, implementing the IRT strategy can have some serious impact on system level efforts to coordinate services as well. I like to think of each IRT as a service coordination lab. The solutions an IRT arrives at to meet the needs of a single consumer could uncover a strategy that would benefit many more. For example, Let's imagine that you have convened an IRT around a job seeker who's deaf. The goal of that team might be to help the customer complete a career pathways machinist training, then find a living wage, permanent, full-time job in a field related to the training. Sound familiar? It should. In order to reach that goal, however, the partners need to develop and fund a communication plan that provides ASL, American Sign Language, interpretation during training, job search, placement, and retention, and funds the whole process. This would be beyond the resources of any one of the partnering agencies. But if the team is successful in leveraging a client's resources in such a precise and coordinated way, this example could be very useful to all of the agencies involved when they find themselves in a similar situation down the line, right? And just for the sake of argument, Let's say there are quite a few job seekers needing ASL communication plans. You now have an example, an outcome of how this complex resource need was successfully addressed to consider at the systems level. And maybe you could develop a pilot or base an MOU on what the IRT has revealed. Okay, I feel like I might be on that soapbox again, but I, I hope you're beginning to see the connections here. All right, advance the slide, thanks. Okay, so this slide covers some material that in my enthusiasm I tapped on into earlier, but it does bear repeating briefly. Okay. The IRT promotes core re rehabilitation values. The IRT is consumer driven and the consumer participates in the IRT as an integral member of the team. As the consumer determines their personal work goal, members of the team are based on the consumer's unique needs and it uh, aligns with and promotes with self-determination and 
and informed choice. Now, these are vocational rehabilitation terms, but they're just as relevant in other systems because in my experience, if self-determination and informed choice are the basis of planning, you get a stronger plan. The IRT, through its collaborative and coordinated approach to service delivery, with its shared customers, shared resources, and shared outcomes, creates a mechanism for shared accountability. And that's really true. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I, I do go all over the place, and I talk to people about WIOA, and I talk to I talk to agencies and staff about partnering more closely uh, with their WIOA and community partners. And one of the things that I hear is that, you know, our partners don't do things the same way we do. And in a lot of ways, our experience tells us they can't be counted on. One of the things that NIRT does is addresses this by bringing it down to a consumer level and it may, giving you a, a forum to have that conversation about those individual service plans. So it gives you a chance to express concerns. It gives you a chance to receive information and clarification about the other provider's plans, and it eliminates a lot of confusion. It also really helps to clarify what each partner has agreed to bring to the table. So it, it's, very, it's uh, very helpful in that way. Now, the last one is new and it's worth discussing. We, we haven't touched on it before. And again, it's not rocket science. If all of the agencies coordinating their plans around those three key parameters, all right, say them with me, common employment goal, lines of communication, and sequence of services, all of the partners ideally should be conserving resources as well overall. Let's just take a look at the example we were talking about on the last slide. The job seeker who needed ASL interpreting for the entirety of their plan. Now, I'm going to guess in that scenario that the training program and the VR counselor would probably be covering a lot of the expenses directly related to the interpreting. Uh, and this would most likely be the case if, if, say, VR was working alone too, right? But what if Title I covered the training costs and maybe even used their business services? to find placement opportunities post-training. That's two significant services that the other partners would normally have to fund that their partner could pick up because the service plans were aligned beforehand and the employment goal was shared. If you multiply this effect over many files, you could begin to notice that your cost per plan was being impacted in a good way. <laughs> One would hope, right? All right. So now we're gonna to move to who participates in an IRT and I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Sarah. Sarah, you ready? I am, thank you, Brian. And please let me know if you can't hear me. So who can be part of an IRT? The short answer, anyone. This slide has some of the usual suspects, however. The workforce system, mental health, vocational rehabilitation, independent living center, programs for deaf and hard of hearing, commission for the blind, community work incentives coordinators, supported employment specialists, housing providers, school or post-secondary education providers, employers, TANF, advocates, friends of the job seekers, others, almost anyone. Because an IRT is customer driven and informal, the membership of each individual IRT can and should be different depending on the client's needs relating to their employment goal, their connections to other systems, and their possible eligibility for systems they may not be yet connected with. Because each provider follows their own procedures and service plans, there is no need for systems level agreements to be in place to move forward with an IRT, only a willing client. This gives the strategy a huge amount of flexibility and allows each team to reflect the needs of the client it is convened for and the goal the team has agreed to. And just to make sure we're clear, next slide, please. Just to be absolutely certain we're good on this, we have a slightly repetitive slide. An IRT 
is an approach used for an individual consumer. An IRT is not an interagency committee consisting of various disability community agencies that focus on systems collaboration. The main purpose of an IRT is employment. The main purpose of an IRT is not resource mapping or to assist an individual to learn about various agency resources. We got it? Okay. Let's talk about how to make an IRT happen. Next slide, please. Now that we're done with this theory, the history, and the relevance of, it's time to get down to the nuts and bolts. How do you coordinate an IRT? Next slide, please. Now, remember when I said the IRT strategy was based on good, solid vocational case management principles? This slide shows what I was referring to. The strategy is implemented in three steps, career exploration, active resource coordination, and the integrated resource team proper, which ideally should lead to the outcome. This kind of a basic flow is pretty standard, right? Develop a goal, identify the resources needed to attain the goal, then implement the identified activities to get the job. But there are details in each of these steps that are unique to the strategy and critically important to its success. We will look at each step in turn and dig a little deeper into those details. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna turn it over to Brian. Thank you. All right, thanks, Sarah. Okay, the first step is career exploration. And there's many different ways to do career exploration. And I've seen a variety of career exploration activities successfully applied by staff using the IRT strategy. Uh, workshops, discovery, one-on-one -on -one guidance, all of these can work well as long as the four points above are in place. The, career ex uh, the IRT career exploration process should result in a proposed employment goal that is self-determined, strength-based, concrete enough to build a plan around, and meets the required outcomes of the systems accessed. So often the people who come to us for help finding a job don't have the faintest idea of what that job should be. And most agencies and providers will have some sort of supports in place to assist them in figuring this out. Um, since most of you work for agencies that probably focus on uh, vocational placement, having an employment goal that's self-determined and strength-based should be right in your wheelhouse but I'm gonna have you think a little bit about those last two bullets. The proposed employment goal needs to be concrete enough to build a plan around. And what I mean by this uh, is that you should know, knowing the client, how to predict the kind of supports that are gonna be needed to attain the employment goal. Will they need additional mental health supports during finals week? Will an accommodation plan be required to help a job seeker manipulate the tiny parts that are part of some of the medical packets they're gonna be assembling? Will the client need a stable, predictable schedule or a very clear organizational chart and support around interaction with coworkers? So the idea is to anticipate the needs of the job seeker before they arise. And in order to do this, the proposed job goal needs to be specific enough to allow you to accurately make these sorts of predictions. Now the final bullet can be a little bit tricky, but it's hugely important. The employment goal needs to meet the outcome requirements of the systems whose resources you need to access. For example, if you're partnering with a housing program, the wages of the job might need to be enough to pay for transitional housing. If you're working with somebody receiving services from corrections, you might need to make sure the employment goal won't compromise the terms of the client's probation. The resources shouldn't drive the goal, but if the goal doesn't align with the partner's definitions of what they can do, then the client's gonna have to do without that partner's resources. So there's no absolute right way to do this, and it's gonna vary based on the employment goal and the client's needs. But a good rule of thumb is in the next slide. So if you could advance that, here you go. Once an employment goal is proposed, you should consider the points above. 
Are there resources and or expertise beyond what is available from your own system that are critical to your consumer's success in attaining the proposed employment goal? What other systems is your consumer currently accessing? And are there other systems that can help your consumer attain and retain the proposed employment goal? If there's resources or expertise needed that your agency can't provide directly, this client's probably gonna need more partners at the table, right? Is your customer currently accessing services from agencies other than your own? If they are, it's a pretty safe bet that resource coordination is gonna be helpful to them and you're gonna need those partners at the table. Are there partners you or the client are aware of that provide services or expertise you predict will be needed to reach the proposed employment goal? And you think the client might be eligible for those services? If that is the case, you might need more partners at the table. So all of this is leading to an obvious question. How do you get these partners to the table? Well, I'm glad you asked that because it's a perfect segue into the next step, active resource coordination. And for this slide, I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah. Sarah, are you ready? I am, Brian. Thank you. Once you have determined the need to have more partners at the table, the second step of the IRT strategy comes into play, active resource coordination. Active resource coordination is the process of identifying needed resources and appropriate and prioritized action steps to address specific targeted barriers to employment experienced by an individual consumer. ARC is likely something you are already doing during the process of intake and plan development. Compared with the current service delivery model, this may just be an enhanced and more intentional step under the IRT approach. An ARC is more than just a referral to multiple service providers. ARC is the process of helping the consumer create a goal-specific, hint, employment goal resource plan. Remember earlier in this presentation when I was referring to customers with multiple challenges to employment. These are the customers who will need to have multiple resources and multiple areas of expertise applied simultaneously in order to have a chance of successfully attaining their employment goal. Not coincidentally, these are the clients who have the most trouble accessing such services. In my experience, this is because of how most providers handle referrals. It's hard enough to follow up on a single referral that leads you into a process meant to determine eligibility, provide assessment, develop a plan, and maintain communication with the agency referred, to let alone more than one. In some cases, many more than one. This is the issue active resource coordination is meant to address. Again, this isn't rocket science. In many, dare I say, most systems, the responsibility for following up on referrals is entirely the client's. This can work if the number of referrals is limited, one or two maybe, but it can become exponentially more challenging if there are three or more. Add to this, the clients with the most resource needs are often the ones that are in crisis or not very far from it. With active resource coordination, the counselor shares the responsibility for following up on referrals with the client and supports the client as they negotiate their way through the processes created by the referral. Next slide, please. Now, when I train on this topic, I often get feedback to the effect of, our agency already provides active resource coordination. And if you do, that's great. But before you write this whole idea off as unnecessary, you should ask yourself the two questions on the slide right now. Are referrals given before or after the development of an employment goal? Is communication between service providers solely the responsibility of the consumer? When you use the IRT strategy referrals that are made after the development of the proposed employment goal, after all, it's not always clear which resources will be needed until you have a pretty clear idea of what you intend to do right. So at the office where you work, 
do you make referrals before or after proposing an employment goal? Also, once the referral is made, who is responsible for the follow-up? Is it the client only? Is the client the go-between you and the agency you refer to? Is this the best for the client, for you? Let's move on. Next slide, please. I feel like this slide is particularly relevant and to the point. So if you'll forgive me, I'll read it to you as you read it yourself. Active resource coordination is more than simple referral. As noted on the previous slide, it includes helping the consumer to engage and approach partners around the potential for partnering with your agency. Many agencies will provide information and referral for consumers, but the consumer may not understand the relevance of a referral or the steps that need to be taken. Active resource coordination helps the consumer to identify, engage, and coordinate resources around their needs relevant to achieving their employment goal. Now let's return to that pressing question. How do you get the partners to the table? As we have just heard, part of the answer lies in supporting a customer to follow up on the referrals you give them. But there is more. You as the counselor have a role as well. Let's look at the next slide. The most important thing you can do for a client to make the outreach to partners go smoothly is to make sure they are positioned to receive resources in your system. Again, this isn't too complicated. Access to your resources for their client or potential client is a powerful reason for partners to connect with you and the client. The idea is to use the resources you do have control over to leverage the ones you and your client need. Have you ever had a partner come and ask you about what you could do for a client when they hadn't committed to doing anything at all themselves? If you were approached in that way, how willing would you be to cooperate? Go in with your hands full, not with your hand out, and you will be much more likely to get a positive response. The first step in approaching any partner is discussing the approach with your client. The client is the one who has the authority to allow you to approach the partner at all, and they will definitely need to do some groundwork around putting releases in place before you can even begin this process. So they have to be on board from the beginning. You will often need to take some time to explain the need for the communication, the things you want to communicate, and the role they need to play in order for the communication to happen. Consider this a way of getting your own house in order before you go calling the neighbors. Next slide, please. Now, you may have noticed I have been referring to the employment goal as the proposed employment goal, and I have been referring to partner's expertise as well as resources. This is because a partner's expertise can be as important as the resources they bring to the table and the employment goal should remain a proposed goal until your partners have the opportunity to weigh in with their expertise and experience. So the employment goal is proposed until consensus is reached at the meeting. Got it? That being said, there are generally two types of partners you will be encountering during this process. Partners you are referring your client to to determine eligibility for their services, like pre-eligibility, and partners your client is currently receiving services from, post-eligibility. The approach with these two types of partners is different, and the next two slides describe some useful approaches to use with them both. In a lot of ways, pre-eligibility is ideal. It gives the counselor a chance to establish contact with an agency prior to services being delivered, and set up a relationship that supports coordination from the very beginning, before the partner has established a service plan. The challenge lies in the fact that the client's eligibility for the partner services has not been established, and there is generally a process involved in establishing it. So here are some helpful tips for doing just that. Introduction, explain that the consumer is currently engaged with your program, eligibility, Ask if there is anything you can do to help your consumer complete the partner's eligibility process. Partnership approach. 
Let the decision maker know that you are interested in discussing the possibility of partnering with them if the consumer is determined eligible for their services and track progress. Be willing to assist in communicating any issues or barriers your consumer might be experiencing during this process to the providers themselves. Now, let's look at reaching out post eligibility. Next slide, please. Approaching partners post eligibility creates its own set of challenges and opportunities. On the plus side, eligibility has been determined and often the support service needed is currently either in place or can be put into place much more quickly than if you're starting from scratch. On the minus side, a service plan is also in place that was developed prior to your contacting the partner and making them aware of your presence and the resources and expertise you're able to bring to the table. So a bit of tact is very useful as you ask questions concerning the specific services that are being delivered. Find out what is in the service plan. What services are being delivered? What is the definition of those services? I mean, think of a term like case management. It means something different to every system you encounter, right? What about placement, retention? Try to find out what exactly is meant by the terms in the service plan. Same goes with timelines. Are there deadlines associated with the outcomes described in the service plan? Is there a time limit on how long supports can be delivered? It's in these types of details that the specifics of future coordination can be revealed. Next, emphasize the benefits of partnering with your program that might be of great value to the consumer. Remember when I mentioned coming with your hands full, not your hand out? This is an example of how that can be useful. Be willing to share information about the resources your system can offer and the expertise you can bring to bear. Offer up the same kinds of information you are interested in, having them share with you. Most systems will have employment as an outcome, even if it's not a primary one. Share with your partner the ways you feel you can help with the client reach the goal you've established in your plan and how that goal could be relevant to their own plan which is the perfect lead into the final bullet, try to uncover areas where you or the partner have some flexibility within the established plans. As I said earlier, one of the challenges in, a partnering, in approaching a partner post eligibility is the fact that the partner has most likely already established a service plan without knowing you were in the picture. Try to uncover the areas in which your plans align or conflict. Explore the possibility of amending the service plans to reflect the additional resources and expertise the client now has access to. Emphasize the benefits to the client of coordinating your efforts and aligning your service plans. All right, what happens next? Well, once contact with the partners has been authorized by the client, and established, the next step is the meeting. Next slide, please. Okay, the job goal has been determined and the active resource coordination process has been accomplished. You and the client should have a list of providers that you are interested in partnering with. And that client is connected to or is in the process of becoming connected to. The next step is to reach consensus around three key parameters with all of these partners. Notice, I didn't say schedule a meeting to achieve this consensus. This is because the consensus, not the meeting that is critical and makes the IRT, not the meeting. In some cases, there may be no need for a meeting. For example, if the team only has two providers, it may be relatively simple to reach consensus with a phone call. Or if you're in a rural area and transportation across long distances is an issue, a different method of convening might be a lot more practical. It's the consensus, not the meeting, that is critical here. That being said, a face-to-face -face meeting is often the most efficient way to reach this consensus, and it has other benefits as well. For example, if you are dealing with a large number of partners, it can be a nightmare to try to approach all of them individually and to negotiate alignment. When I train staff in the field on the IRT, I used to say there are two or more partners, schedule the meeting. Also, 
there in my experience, a face-to-face -face meeting increases the flow of information between the prospective IRT members and increases accountability across the board for both the partners and the client. There is definitely a reason the meeting is the preferred method of reaching consensus. So let's move on. I'm going to hand it over to Brian. We'll go to the next slide. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, the prep's been done. It's time to facilitate the meeting. So let's take a look at how that's done. If you can advance the slide, please. Okay, the first part of the IRT meeting should include the three bullets above, which begins with introductions. Ideally, the client should be handling this bit and you should have worked with them beforehand to feel comfortable facilitating, if not the meeting as a whole, at least the introductions. Again, what this looks like is gonna vary quite a bit from client to client. Some are gonna leap at the chance and some may panic at the very thought, but this is the client's meeting that will be determining a big part of their lives for the next year or so. And it's critical that they be perceived as the reason that everyone is gathered. Now, once the introductions have gone around the table, you and the client can take some time to describe the work that you've been doing together the plan that you've developed, and the reasons you feel that this is the best course of action for the client. It's good to be very clear and specific about the resources and services that your agency has or could commit. Show them you come to the table with your hands full, right? And that you're interested in hearing about the plans that the client has with them. This is also an opportunity for the partners to ask questions or voice concerns about what it is you and the client have proposed. Now, IRT stands for Integrated Resource Team, and there's a reason for this. The idea is for the team to put their collective heads together and determine the best way to use the resources and expertise available to the client to achieve the employment goal. In order to do this most effectively, an environment needs to be created where each of the partner's area of expertise are acknowledged and considered. For example, if the mental health provider brings up concerns regarding a part of what you propose, you should listen to, acknowledge, and work with the mental health provider to address that concern. This process isn't about TURP. It's about using all of the resources and expertise available to your client to help them reach their employment goal. And to be willing to acknowledge and address partners' concerns is the best way to get them to do the same for you around the topics where you are the expert. Okay, next slide, please. Reaching consensus. It leads us back to those three key parameters that we've been weaving, uh, that have been weaving their way in and out of this discussion. So I think it's probably time that we take some time to talk about them specifically, starting with the common employment goal. Next slide. The common employment goal is the first on our list for a reason. As you've now heard me say many times, <laughs> the IRT is developed specifically to support a client to reach it. Without an employment goal, no IRT. It's also the first step in aligning service plans. Unless you can reach consensus on the employment goal, the next two steps are not possible. As we discussed earlier during the section on career exploration, the proposed employment goal needs to be specific enough to build a plan around and to access the resources that the client is going to need to reach to reach it right during the IRT meeting this concept is extended to the partners do they include employment as an outcome most providers do if not as a primary one as Sarah was saying then as a secondary one if so how do they define a successful employment outcome what are the details involved in their definition is there a wage goal, a timeline, either to obtain employment or retain it? Are there conditions that must be met before employment can be pursued? Successful uh, coordination is always about the details, right? How are these resources brought into the picture? Remember the example I used earlier about the housing provider who needed an employment goal with a wage substantial enough to support transitional housing services and a timeline dependent upon the availability of such housing. This is the stuff which IRTs are made of, guys. 
And not coincidentally, this type of discussion around the employment goal should lead quite nicely to the next parameter, which is lines of communication. So if you'd advance the slide, we'll talk a little bit about it. Lines of communication are all about anticipating a client's supports and developing a strategy to respond to them prior to the need. It's about trying to move your efforts as a team from reactive to proactive. Always, as always, this process must start with the client. The client needs to agree in advance to the information exchange and take whatever steps are needed to authorize it. The secret to this is again in the level of detail you're able to reach based on the employment goal and the needs and requirements of the IRT members around the sharing of such information. For example, a mental health provider, if a mental health provider is working with your client, it may not be possible for them to inform the team of the client's progress toward or the details of their service plan. But the mental health provider might be able to receive updates about the progress toward and the details of their employment activities and agree to coordinate their mental health supports with the employment activity whenever possible like scheduling check-ins to coincide with tests or job interviews for a client who experiences anxiety and depression, maybe. Finally, it's always wise to designate a point of contact. A team member who's going to be in charge of disseminating the information that you've all agreed to share. This team member does not necessarily need to be the facilitator of the meeting. It should be the team member who's gonna be most involved in the activities that the client is currently engaging in as you move towards the employment goal. And this can change over time. For example, it might make sense to designate a representative of the community college's Office of Disability as the point of contact while a customer is engaging in a career pathways training. Then shift it to a VR counselor or a Title I case manager during placement, then maybe a job coach during retention which leads us to the final parameter, the sequence of services. If you can progress the slide, please. So sequence of services cover most importantly, which services will be needed at which point as a client moves towards their employment goal. And if the resources and expertise represented by the team are gonna be able to provide those needed supports as the plan progresses. What the resource challenges that have, what are the resource challenges that have brought you all together? What are the support needs? Are they going to change as the client moves towards their goal? Are there any gaps that still need to be addressed? Again, the key to effective coordination is in the details. What will the customer need during training, placement, through retention? Will those needs remain the same or are they going to evolve as the client progresses? How does the client's needs align with the timelines of the provider serving them? Are there limits to the amount of support that can be provided by a particular partner? Is there a deadline on how long a support can be provided? How about a dollar cap? Are there certain milestones that need to be reached before a support can be provided or after which it can't? If such issues are encountered, how can the team overcome or sidestep them? Can one partner pick up a service after another has reached their funding cap for that service or has reached the deadline for which the service can be delivered? This is when the combined knowledge of all the partners of the intricacies of their own systems can be applied creatively to address the resource gaps that the client is experiencing in ways that would be impossible if they were serving the client alone. So there you have it, the three key parameters that make the IRT. I'll say them one more time just for effect because they really are the most important part. Common employment goal, lines of communication, and sequence of services. All right, enough of that. Let's move to the next slide. Okay, by the end of a successful IRT meeting, the client and the partner should have aligned their service plans around the three key parameters, which now should be chiming through your head, so I'm not going to say them. Each provider is going to document what has occurred in their own systems in a way that their procedures require them to do. Remember, you just spent the whole meeting making sure that all the partners were operating within their established guidelines and procedures. So no permission should be, should be needed. Because of this, each partner is going to be able to claim the outcome of the strategy in their own system. 
and each partner retains their individual service plans. The difference is the client has the benefit of the resources and expertise available from multiple systems and access to strategies that are richly resourced. And on a final note, it's never a bad idea to set up a date for the next meeting at the end of the one you're in. Perhaps linked to some milestone in the strategy, like completion of a training or placement in a job, knowing that an ad hoc meeting can always be called if unseen need or circumstances should arise. Okay, we are in the home stretch, guys. Uh, the next section is a couple of examples of real live IRTs that we'd like to go through with you. Um, and we think it's really helpful to tie all the loose ends together of this training. And to start that, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Sarah. Sarah, are you ready? I sure am. Thank you, Brian. This first sample one, we're going to go over, I'm just going to go real quickly, to attain certification as an automotive mechanic through a career pathways training to find full-time employment relevant to that certification at $14 to $18 an hour, to access additional resources and complete further training to attain additional certifications in this field, leading to a significant wage increase. So how the IRTs work to perform the form of goals, we're gonna go through a few examples of um, possible partners that would work in this case. First being vocational rehabilitation. They could provide a possible on-the-job training for a full-time position, possible tools needed for a full-time position like assistive technology, possible consultation and expertise around disability and accommodation. The Title I program has access to funding for career pathways, automotive mechanics training, money for tools needed for the training, possible on-the-job training funding, and access to vocational case management. CBI, housing, possible housing case management, possible placement in transition apartment for duration of trainings and placement. It's important that you have somewhere to live if you want to work. Possible access to treatment slash transition counseling. A criminal justice partner, possible continuing and documentable drug screening, possible advice and guidance around how employment plans and goals can be set and attained without compromising obligations around the terms of probation, possible access to a mental health provider and a treatment plan, um, HVRP, veterans partners, possible assistance and advocacy around child support obligations as they relate to maintaining housing throughout the whole plan, possible assistance around accessing additional resources for continued certifications post-placement. And we've got one more before we go, we're gonna walk through and Brian's gonna take us through that. Next slide, please. Okay. So here's another example. And uh, I, I really like this format because it kind of lays it out. One of the things to remember is, is Sometimes things are listed twice, like in that last example, we had OJT multiple times. And this is because an OJT in the Title I system looks a little different from the OJT in the Vocational Rehabilitation System. And it's kind of an embarrassment of riches, right? Uh, as you move through the plan, you might have the option of using either, either OJT, depending on the circumstances. So again, that's just kind of one of the one of the uh, advantages of an IRT. So let's let's look at this employment goal. Completion of career pathway certificate certific excuse me certificated machinist training and placement in full time machining position at twelve to fifteen dollars an hour, with the possibility of advancement and significant wage increases. So let's take a look at what Voc Rehab has said they're going to do. So they're gonna provide possible OJT for a full-time position, possible consultation and expertise around disability and accommodation. And in this case, they get a bit more specific, specifically coordinating with community college interpreters, readers, and instructors around communicating with the consumer, possible funding for placement interpreting services, possible funding for tools associated with placement, possible coordination of and possible funding for tutoring services for duration of training, possible job development and or coaching for placement. 
So in this plan, Voc Rehab is, is doing some heavy lifting. What's the Title I provider up to? Uh, they're gonna make uh, the resume workshop available to the client. They're gonna give access to, to a cell phone so that the client can be reached. Also internet access. They're gonna access their labor exchange and they're gonna provide funding for the training, the machinist training. They're gonna provide interpreting for the planning meetings. They're gonna provide possible funding for tools associated with the training. They're gonna provide access to vocational case management, specifically coordinating with the community college interpreters, readers, and instructors around communicating with the customer. Now, this, this customer is probably uh, somebody who uses American Sign Language, right? That's pretty clear from the supports that are being outlined here. And that's always a very challenging situation. But I think it's a good example because you can see how that burden is being split up between the providers and it's being coordinated through the IRT. So the Community College Office of Disability Services is going to provide interpreting services for the duration of training and or internship, possible coordination with VR concerning communication strategies and student progress, and possible coordination with placement interpreting team. So basically there, there, there needs to be two, uh, two interpreting teams probably, one in the school and one out on the job. And what they're doing is anticipating the need for one communications team to communicate with the other as they hand the baton. So that's pretty good coordinating, I would say. The Community College Career Pathways Program is gonna coordinate with instructors, interpreters, VR and Title I case manager around student progress and communication strategies and is possibly gonna coordinate with the team around internship and placement strategies. So there you have it. That's a very, very well-resourced strategy, right? that covers many, many anticipated needs up front. Okay, I just kind of have one final thing to say. We're, we're in the home stretch. Um, and I really think that these examples demonstrate how complex resource needs can be addressed through the alignment of multiple resources and service plans in a way that's customized to meet the needs of a single client. And to end today, I just want to say that the integrated resource team is an informal customer level strategy for coordinating resources for customers with complex resource needs and gaps in available resources. It requires no systems level agreement to implement and it aligns tightly with the philosophy and the goals of WIOA. It can even help an agency comply with those requirements and help their clients attain WIOA performance. Implementing the IRT is not rocket science and it uses many of the skills and strategies that your agency might currently be applying. It aligns with values of self-determination and customization of services. And it does this by providing a framework that move these, moves these activities from a reactive to a proactive frame. This allows the agency to increase the frequency, consistency, and sustainability of these activities. And although the IRT is a customer level strategy, it generates ideas, relationships, and outcomes that can have huge systems level significance over time. And with that, I'm gonna roll the credits. <laughs> you have just completed the training and I hope you found it a useful and uh, valuable way to spend your time. And I think we have some time for questions if there are any. So Sarah, I turn it back over to you. Thank you very much for the great information. And we do have a question and let me pull that back up. Um, oops, hold on. So the question was from the example, the first example that Sarah went through, she wanted to know what was the difference between the roles between Title I and Voc Rehab and VR in that example. Could you give a little clarification, Sarah? Do you want me to go back to that slide? Sure, you can go back to it. Whoops. 
So what are the difference? So as Brian and I had both mentioned before, there's going to be things that multiple partners can do. So these are all what they we would say potential um, resources that each of these agencies can offer. So it's true, like both Title I of Vocation and Rehabilitation could possibly give an on-the-job training, you know, for a full-time position. And so it's helping, like the IRT helps to reach that consensus for who will provide what, so that it's not just one partner that's providing all of it. So potentially, say, vocational rehabilitation does provide the funding for an on-the-job training. Well, in that case, perhaps Title I can use then that access um, of career pathway funding for the automobile mechanic training. It's, sometimes we call it blend, blending and braiding of funds. It's figuring out, yes, even though both agencies could theoretically pay for something, you also try to work with them to figure out, um, you know, what's the best you know, possible use of each person's resources. Does that Sarah, make sense? can I jump in? Yeah, go right ahead, Brian, please. I'd, I'd also say too that um, the, dip, the OJTs in the different systems have different eligibility requirements to apply. Meaning um, in, in a Title I OJT, you're gonna have to be full-time, for example. In a VR, you're going to have to have full-time uh, wages, uh, full-time hours with benefits generally. In a VR OJT, not necessarily. So having both options on the table for a situation where you don't know the details to yet, which would be the placement at this point in the uh, in the strategy, right? Because right now we're talking, we're at the very front end. We don't know what the placement opportunity is going to look like exactly, even though we've tried very hard to define it. <laughs> So it might be a situation where you're going to determine which, which provider is going to provide that OJT based on the circumstances. And I hope that, I hope that helped to answer. Yes, thank you. So we have a hand up, Laura, I'm going to unmute you. And if you have a microphone, you can ask your question. So if you don't have a microphone, if you could put your question in either the question or the chat, I'm sure our presenters will be happy to address. Eager to address. Yeah, eager, eager, there you go. <laughs> and for anyone, if you have any other um, clarifications or questions on all of the wealth of information that they shared with you, please feel free to share that at that, uh, to ask at this point. As I did mention earlier, um, you will be able to access this on the WorkNet site. Uh, give us a little time to get that up. The PowerPoint as a PDF is available for you as a handout. If you want to look at the slides and review some of this in, uh, important information. Also, as I mentioned, you will receive a survey about today's webinar. So please share with us your experience and any suggestions you might help um, to help us improve all of our webinars in the, in the future. Um, we'll give just another little bit of time, but I don't see any other questions at this point. Do you have any questions? Oh, hold on, got one other. I have really enjoyed hearing, um, my background is adult education. Title II, so it was, it's very helpful to hear um, how best we can integrate with the teams. So thank you very much for sharing. Uh, but I think right now we're at a point that we can thank you, uh, thank all of our attendees, and thank you for all the valuable work that you do out there in Illinois and for our presenters across the country. And um, unless you have final words for us, Sarah, we're gonna say goodbye. Oh, no, but I'm glad you brought up Title II because I think education is an important partner for integrated resource teams. And especially when you're working with youth partners, um, I find that it's really, really helpful to bring those IRTs together. So yeah, and, 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 and I would also say that education can implement an IRT and start one themselves. It doesn't necessarily have to be someone from Title I or Vocational Rehabilitation. Anyone could do an IRT.
Anyone can do an IRT. Anyone. That's one of the beautiful things about it. I, I'd also like to say, uh, I'd like to give a little plug. There's, there's a couple uh, in the resources. If you could ask it for it. Yeah, there you go. One more. There you go. There is, oh, I'm trying no, to get yeah. to the movie one. Yeah, oh, the videos. Okay. The videos. Um, the, these two videos uh, really kind of help to illustrate what we're talking about. And they're examples of actual IRTs where they talk to the client and all of the partners about the process and how it worked. So if you, you, you know, they're both about 15 minutes long. Now I know the Portland, Oregon one is, is still where we left it. I'm not sure that the uh, South Dakota one is still there, but if it's not, if you let me know, I will look into getting you a link that, that works. I think it might still be. Uh, but the Portland, Oregon one is definitely on Vimeo. Uh, the, it's a good complement to this training. Also on the WinTAC website, there's an extended uh, recording of this training that you can access, although it sounds like uh, Sarah's gonna save this presentation for you as well. Um, also our contact information is listed on the PowerPoint. And if you have any additional questions, once you've thought about it, um, about the IRT or anything we've talked about today, please feel free to contact us. All right, again, thank you very much, both Brian and Sarah for sharing this information and these resources, very helpful. Thank you to all our attendees and um, have, a, have a great day. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.